Okay, so good afternoon. Um, I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of Center for Labor Studies. Um, I'll just take a few moments to introduce our speaker today. Um, it is a privilege uh, to have uh, Michael Heinrich with us today. Um, he is, for you, for those who do, do not know, uh, he teaches economics at Berlin and is also uh, an editor in Procla Journal for uh, critical social science. He is also uh, the author of uh, books such as uh, the, the Science of Value, um, with, with the subtitle Marxist Critique of Political Economy Between Scientific uh, um, be, uh, Between uh, Political Economy and um, um, Scientific um, Realism. Between, between Scientific Revolution and oh, Classical yeah. Tradition. That, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> And uh, he's also an author of an introduction to the three volumes of uh, Karl Marx's Capital, uh, which will be available in Croatian translation yeah, till the end of this year. <laughs> the end? <laughs> Months, Months, that is. Uh, uh, today he will, have, he will have two lectures. Uh, the first one, um, Value, Fetishism and Impersonal Domination. Uh, here at the MAMA, and then the second lecture at uh, 8 o'clock uh, under the title The Bourgeois State, uh, Class Domination of the, uh, on the Basis of Freedom and uh, Equality, um, and that will, be, uh, that, that will be held at the Faculty of uh, Humanities and Social Sciences. Now, uh, I, I, I would like to thank, our, uh, first of all, our comrades at uh, MAMA for um, allowing us uh, to have this uh, space uh, for, for this lecture. And uh, also uh, our sponsors, um, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung L uh, in Belgrade, uh, for their um, moral and material support. Um, yeah, before we begin, um, we, have, we have this list of participants that we, we would like you to sign. This is for our sponsors so that they, they could check uh, who is coming to these, these kind of lectures. <laughs> uh, the, the lecture will last approximately 45 minutes to one hour. And after that, we have, I think, enough time for questions and comments and uh, hopefully productive discussion. So without any further ado, I hope that, I, that you received all these information that I've <coughs> sent. And um, <laughs> anyway, uh, Michael, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction and also thank you very much for the invitation to uh, speak here. Um, I want to, to speak about value theory, about Marxian value theory. And uh, um, when we speak about this issue, there is a traditional view uh, in which this issue seems to be rather easy, rather simple. There is a labor theory of value uh, already formulated by Adam Smith and David Ricardo. Marx uh, accepts uh, this labor theory of value and um, brings it to a, to a peak. Maybe he's uh, the top uh, guy in, in this list. But essentially, uh, very often it is seen as a kind of unity. Smith, uh, Ricardo, Marx, uh, they had essentially the same uh, labor theory of value, which nowadays is opposed uh, to a marginal utility theory uh, of value. But this very simple uh, view is uh, not at all uh, correct. On the one hand, uh, when you read carefully Smith and Ricardo, you can see that there is not just one labor uh, theory of value which tells us labor creates value. There, the things are more complicated, but unfortunately today my issue is Marx and not uh, Smith and Ricardo, therefore I will not go in depth uh, in, in this point. I just mention it also with the classical economists. It is not so easy with uh, labor theory of value. 
What I will stress is that Marx is not just a representative of the labor theory of value. By the way, he never mentioned this term. He never speaks of labor theory of value. He only speaks of value theory. Uh, so I want to stress that Marx is not just a representative. In some respect, he is a critic of this classical labor theory of value. But because uh, at, since the end of the 19th century, we have this big conflict between objective labor theory of value on the one hand, utility theories on the other hand, the differences, the critique of Marx against uh, Smith and Ricardo is uh, underestimated. And I want to to highlight these differences in order to, uh, to highlight uh, certain aspects of Marx uh, value theory, which are already mentioned in the title of uh, the lecture, uh, Fetishism and Impersonal Rule. So what are now the, the differences? What are now the, the big uh, achievements of Marx value theory? At first, and this maybe is not uh, questioned very much, there is a difference in scope. Uh, when you read Smith and Ricardo, what, what is for them the interesting point, what they want to understand, it is uh, they, they want to explain the quantitative exchange relations why um, commodity A exchanges with commodity B in, in a relation two, uh, um, uh, two times A against one time B. Marx's scope, uh, when he speaks about value theory, is not just um, a quantitative exchange relation. Marx's uh, scope of interest, of analysis, is much deeper. He understands value theory as a social theory, a, a theory which explains us how a society or an, an economy can work in which, on the one hand, the, the producers are dependent on each other because of the division of labor, but on the other hand, these producers behave as if they were uh, lonesome Robinsons. They, uh, they produce privately, independently uh, from each other. So what is this, and, and when we are so used to this, that um, maybe we, we not even see how crazy this situation is that you, on the one hand, depend on each other, but on the other hand, you negate, you ignore this, uh, this dependence. So, uh, when Marx speaks of value theory, it is not just a limited economic theory, it is a, a theory or a consideration how this kind of economy and society is possible. It exists, but how is this possible? So this, his value theory is already, by, by this different scope, a part of his critical project. When you read Capital, you should uh, take uh, care of the subtitle of the book. It's not only capital. The subtype, subtitle is Critique of Political Economy. Political economy in these times was just the usual term for economics, or what we call nowadays economics, economic uh, sciences. And when Marx uh, uses the subtitle Critique of Political Economy, then this means that he not just criticized uh, certain theories, he criticized, or he made at least the attempt to criticize, a whole science. 
And how can you criticize a whole science and not only a, a single theory? You criticize a whole science uh, in so far you put into question what is taken for granted in this science. <laughs> what is taken so much for granted that it seems not even necessary to discuss it or to, to give reason for this. And this critical project in, in Marx starts already with value theory. In the first chapter of Capital, about the commodity, uh, Marx uh, gives us a, a very um, valuable um, consideration on this. In this section, on in this sub subsection on fetishism, he writes that the classical political economy more or less correctly found the content of the form of the, co uh, of the commodity, meaning they found that the value is determined by labor. But, he added then, they, the classical political economists, they never asked why this content, labor, takes this form, value. They take this for granted. Why they did take this for granted? Because they take commodity production for granted. And Marx doesn't take commodity production for granted. He takes it as a special social form which has to be analyzed as such a special form. And this starts with uh, his value theory. In so far, to say Marx has a different scope in his value theory, he not only wants to, to explain quantitative uh, um, exchange relations, but he sees it as a social theory, is already a basic critic to this uh, uh, science of political economy. And not only uh, the, the point that he had uh, a different scope. But his, um, his, that he puts in, in question such basic uh, things is not restricted to the scope. The next point he puts in question is labor itself. It is well known that Adam Smith um, as an answer to the question what determines the um, exchange value of a commodity um, denied the in these times traditional answer that uh, the exchange value of a commodity is determined by the utility of the commodity. Uh, Adam Smith with his famous example of uh, water and diamonds, water is so um, um, useful for uh, man, but uh, has such a small exchange value. Diamonds have a uh, big exchange value and is not so useful. By this example, he denied the, the old utility theory and um, produced a new theory, this labor theory of value, that the labor which is necessary to produce uh, something that this labor is um, the, the reason for exchange value. This starting point of the classical uh, labor theory of value, Marx already criticized. He criticized the not critical treatment of labor, just to take labor as labor is something uh, very simple which uh, needs no more questions. Um, he starts with the twofold character of the commodity as a use value and exchange value and he simply uh, draws the consequence when the commodity has a twofold character then also the commodity producing labor has to be a twofold character. On the one hand, labor which 
um, produces use value. On the other hand, the same uh, labor constitutes the value. Labor which produces use value is the concrete labor, the labor we observe when we see how a person is working. The labor which produces value we cannot observe. And this now is the critical point against uh, the classics that labor which produces uh, value is abstract labor. Value is an abstraction. It is the, um, the abstraction from the different use values of different commodities. It is the abstraction um, which gives us an abstract economic uh, unity called value. And this is a pure social unity, this, this value, um, in uh, opposite to the use value. In, in use value, it depends from the natural um, attributes of the things. Value is a pure social uh, entity. And so the, the consequence, Marx draw, also abstract labor, which produces um, uh, value, is a pure social entity and uh, in, in no case something natural or something which exists in every society. In many Marxist uh, discussions, this twofold character of um, commodity producing labor is mentioned, but uh, it is not really used. It is, I, I think, in some respect, it is neglected, just uh, it is seen as a kind of refinement. The classics speak of labor as such. Marx divides uh, labor in concrete labor producing use value, abstract labor producing um, value. But this, this difference has a, a very fundamental meaning and Marx himself points to this fundamental meaning in Capital. When you read the, the first chapter of Capital, you find the nice uh, sentence there that Marx mentions this double character of um, commodity producing labor was first discovered by myself. It is the decisive point to understand anything in uh, political economy. It is very rare that Marx applauds to himself in, in such a way that he said, oh, I am the first guy who discovered this and this is the decisive point. And when he is doing this, it must have a big importance for, for him. But when you look in, in a, a lot of literature, it is not clear why this is so, uh, it has such a big importance. And I try in, in this lecture here, I try to, to stress this importance. First, it is important because abstract labor is a purely social construction. It is not in any way natural. Uh, Marx hints when he speaks of uh, abstract labor, labor in the physiological sense as spending brain and muscles, is misleading because it is not a natural thing, it is a social thing in so far that abstract labor is the recognition of the privately spent individual labor of, of the commodity producer as a part of social labor. The private producer produces a, a use value and then tries to sell this use value in the market. Only when this uh, selling process is successful, then his privately spent labor is recognized as a part of the total social labor. And what is the way in which this recognition 
is done, it is done in so far this privately spent labor is accepted as abstract labor. So abstract labor is not just a social construction, it is a social construction which connects the Robinsons of the um, bourgeois society with the, the universal dependence of this Robinson. So it is a decisive uh, social construction. But as, a, so, as, as uh, such a social construction, it is not easily to fix or to, to measure. And this is also a, a big uh, point of weakness in, in a lot of um, traditional Marxist uh, debates and, and contributions that um, it is thought we can measure abstract labor just in hours with uh, uh, using our watches. But when we use our watch to measure labor time, which labor time do we measure then? We measure the labor time we can observe. We see someone is working, let us say a carpenter, producing a table. We measure he needs five hours for this table. But what then we had measured? We didn't measure abstract labor time. We measured the time of concrete labor which was necessary to produce this certain use value. The measure of abstract labor time is not possible in uh, labor magnitudes, it is only possible in money. And this is a, a decisive point which Marx stresses in, in the first volume of Capital in uh, chapter 3, where he introduces money as measure of value as a necessary not to avoid measure of value. Uh, and in his earlier uh, book about uh, the critique of political economy, this first two chapters which appeared in the year 1859, eight years before volume one of Capital, he explicitly speaks about that the immediate form of uh, existence of abstract labor is money. So this social uh, construction, abstract labor, we can only measure by, by money, not by uh, labor time. But this uh, abstract labor as a social construction also has consequences for what Marx calls substance of value. When you read Capital, very early in, in the first chapter, Marx uh, speaks uh, about the substance of value, that abstract labor is substance of value. And again, in, in many uh, contributions, this substance is understood as something which belongs to a single commodity. So, we have this table produced as a commodity and somewhere inside, wherever, is a certain amount of the substance of value. But this is definitely not meant by Marx. Uh, already in, in the first few pages, he speaks of this substance as a common substance, not a substance you can find in an isolated um, um, commodity, a substance which is common in the exchange process when you exchange one commodity with another commodity. And this argument that you cannot speak of uh, the substance of an uh, isolated commodity, this is developed a little bit more extensively in his reworking manuscript when he reworked 
the first edition of uh, volume one of Capital to come to the second edition. The second edition shows a lot of changes to the first edition and in this and especially in, in the first uh, chapters uh, dealing with value theory and there exists a, a very interesting um, manuscript in which Marx did the reworking and in which he gave commentaries to himself. Marx comments his own presentation in, in the first edition. He uh, argues something is to be misunderstood and therefore I have to change this and this and uh, indeed you find such changes then in, in the second edition. This manuscript, unfortunately, until now, is only published in the Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe, this new big edition of all uh, Marx and Engels uh, works and manuscripts, which um, will not be such a small edition like the, the German MEV with uh, 43 volumes. Uh, when this new mega will be uh, finished, it will include 114 volumes and there also this manuscript is published and unfortunately not translated but in um, this introduction I, I wrote and which will be in, in Croatian language uh, ready at the end of this month I used this manuscript and gave also some um, some quotes from this regarding uh, the point I'm speaking here that substance, value substance, is not an attribute of a single commodity, it is a common attribute. Because it is a, a common attribute, it's, by, by the way, maybe this would be more interesting in, in the evening when I, I think it is the philosophical faculty Yes, for philosophers, uh, maybe it's, uh, it would be more, more interesting uh, that the, the notion of substance Marx uses in, in Capital, in some respect, also provides a basic critic for the, um, the mainstream debate on substance uh, starting with Aristotle. Marx was, um, he estimated Aristotle very much and also in Capital, in, in the footnotes, you can find commentaries to, to Aristotle. But his notion of substance is definitely a critique of the discourse on, on substance starting with uh, Aristotle. But, okay, this only as a, as a side remark because I'm not in a philosophical faculty here. Um, this new uh, idea, this new concept of, uh, of substance has a lot of consequences. Uh, now for, for the issues here, the, the most important consequence is that this substance as a relational substance is only visible, will only find a, a form of appearance in a relation. And this relation is what Marx calls the value form, the expression of value. The value of one commodity can only be expressed by a second commodity and this relation is the value form. In chapter one of uh, Capital, which is devoted to the commodity, this subsection on value form is the biggest subsection and it is also the subsection to which Marx devoted most of his time which was uh, very often changed. He tried to be more precise. Uh, he starts in, in Grundrisse with it. It was reworked in, in the 59 text. It came in, in a much different form in the first edition of Capital. Then he changed a lot to, to the second edition. So this value form analysis had a big importance for Marx. But in the 
reception in the literature about Marx, in the literature about capital, uh, we can say in the first 100 years it was nearly totally ignored. Only since the 1970s in, in some um, circles, in some uh, lines of discussion, this value form analysis plays um, an important role. In Germany, there starts uh, in, in late 60s, early 70s, this so-called Neue Marx Lektüre, new reading of Marx. And one of the important points for this new reading was to, to try to understand the importance of value form analysis. The, the older uh, reception focused on substance in a very limited way, just to stress the substance of value is labor, not utility. Okay, it's true, but it depends what kind of labor and what kind of substance. In value form analysis, you see that the special character of this substance as a relational substance makes necessary value form, the expression of substance. But to come to an adequate expression of substance, it is not uh, so easy. This is the, the content of this subsection of, uh, on, on value form. An adequate uh, expression of value you can find only in money. In so far, money is not just an additional to value or like is, it is seen in, in bourgeois mainstream economics, money is a tool in order to make life easier uh, if we would try to exchange uh, products directly. It would be very uh, difficult when the butcher comes with the steak to the baker, to the bakery, but the baker is a vegetarian, he doesn't want steak. Uh, it's very complicated. Money makes uh, the life easier. This is the usual explanation when you are in a um, department on economics and you ask why do we use money, why, why we have money, then you will uh, get such explanations. Marx tries to show that the importance of money is much, much more fundamental than just a helper in, in everyday life. Value cannot exist, cannot become practically without relation to money. This is, by the way, also one of his main critics against Ricardo. Marx estimated Ricardo very much, much higher, I think, than he estimated Adam Smith. But in this point, he says, money, uh, uh, Ricardo doesn't understand the relation between value, labor, and money. That they are inseparably connected. Uh, Ricardo connects value and labor, like the bulk of traditional Marxism is also doing, but he sees not a necessary connection to, to money. And this is the point Marx stresses in his critique against Ricardo. You can find in the second book of uh, Theories of Surplus Value. So, in, in this Neue Marx Lecture in, in the 70s in Germany was the term coined monetary value theory to express this specificity of Marx value theory that there is an inseparable connection between value and money. And in, in my work, uh, among others, I tried to, um, to extend uh, this concept of monetary value theory. It's not a term coined by Marx. You will nowhere find uh, such a term in Marx. It is a, a term which tries to characterize uh, an important point in, in Marx uh, value theory. So, 
until now, oh, I see time is uh, running. Until now, I tried to, to show differences between Marx value theory and this classical labor theory of value and also the, uh, the dominant receptions of uh, value theory in, in Marxist uh, discussions. I spoke about uh, the, the scope which is different. I spoke um, about abstract, the, uh, about labor, that the, the, term, the notion of labor changed by Marx to, to abstract uh, labor and that this had also consequences for, um, for the notion of or the concept of uh, substance. Now I want uh, to come to two further uh, consequences. The one is fetishism and the other is impersonal rule. The uh, last subchapter of this first chapter on commodity in capital is called the uh, fetish uh, character of the commodity and its secret. And the, the notion commodity fetishism in the meantime is rather widespread, but uh, in, in many cases I think not very well understood. First, when we talk about fetishism, we have to, to have in mind that in Marx days, fetishism means something else than fetishism mostly uh, means uh, uh, today. Today, when we hear, uh, when we speak about fetishism, our discussion is influenced by uh, f the, the studies of Sigmund Freud about fetishism. We think of some sexual obsessions with ob objects and this is called fetishism. In Marx times, this notion of fetishism was completely unknown. Fetishism meant uh, some so-called primitive religion uh, views. Uh, these views, uh, the European um, conquerors found, for example, uh, in, in Africa, in some tribes, that they produced uh, little pieces of, uh, of wood or of leather, uh, painted it, and then they were uh, in fear of it because they thought that these things had magic forces, uh, they had power about uh, people and you must be very um, cautious with it. And of course the European uh, colonial powers took this as a proof for the primitivity of uh, such tribes. They produce a stick of wood and then they are in fear of it. So uh, European colonialism uh, is a good thing to bring culture, rationality to such uh, primitive uh, people. When Marx uses this term fetishism in capital, on the one hand it has a, a polemical quality. He tries to show to the bourgeois society, look, you think you are so enlightened, you are so rational, but at the core of uh, your society, in your economic system, you also have a certain kind of fetishism. So in some respect it was a... Um, it, it had polemical reasons to use this word, but on the other hand it was also very precise to use this word. Why? Because there is really a kind of fetishism in, in the core of bourgeois society. The, the relations in a market society between producers are not immediate relation from person to person. They are relations mediated by things. 
in a market society, the private producers exchange their things. The, the social relation exists not between uh, the persons, it exists between the things. And by this, the things receive social attributes. The things are made by humans, of course. Uh, that they have social attributes is a consequence of the structure of uh, the market society. But nevertheless, these things and their attributes, you can uh, uh, see, you can encounter uh, in everyday life in bourgeois society. From the market movements, we are all dependent. The capitalist uh, um, entrepreneurs are dependent from these market movements of prices of commodities. They decide if they can make a profit or not. The, the employed persons who sell the labor power to uh, the capitalists are dependent because if their labor power is needed to make profit or not depends on these market movements. So, we are all submitted to this, um, to this rule of things. It is not an illusion, it is not an, a kind of ideology to, to say, oh, the things have social quality. No. In bourgeois society, they really have social quality, social attributes, because this society is structured in such a crazy way that humans who are dependent on each other are not in a direct contact, are not uh, discussing what they need, what they want to produce, what they are able to produce and so on. They are mediated by things. This mediation by things is not uh, gives the the commodities this social attribute independent social attributes and because the commodities need for their relation money money is the most social thing in bourgeois society in uh, in grundrisse marx uh, uh, used the nice sentence to say when we have money it means that we can put our society in our bag. We have the society as a thing which we can put in, in our bag. And this is exactly the point that the thing, money, no matter if it is a, a gold coin or a paper printed uh, by the central bank, that this thing has social power. So fetishism is not an illusion. It is not a wrong consciousness uh, ideology or something. In the bourgeois society, in a capitalist market society, this fetishism, the rule of things, really uh, is really existent. It is a reality. It has an elusive side, but just at a different point. This fetishism seems to be natural. It seems to be unavoidable. And here Marx uh, speaks of a uh, in, in volume in, in chapter one in Capital, He's, he used the term phantasmagorie, a fantastic thing, an elusive thing you can say, but not for the bourgeois society, there it's a reality, but for the idea that fetishism we have in every society, it is not to avoid. 
A nice example for this fetishism in, in the elusive sense is Adam Smith. Adam Smith in his um, important work about the wells of nations discusses uh, a lot of issues which are unusual for, for modern economic textbooks. For example, he discusses what is the difference between a human and an animal. And uh, the answer of uh, Adam Smith is the difference between a human being and an animal is the exchange. Animals, they struggle for things. Maybe they kill each other. But you never saw animals exchange things. Two dogs, maybe they, they struggle about a bone. But you never saw them exchange one big bone against two small bones or something like this. This is an attribute you find only with humans. So, to exchange things, to produce commodities, this makes humans to humans. And this is a, a perfect illustration for this kind of fetishism in the elusive sense. What we find in the bourgeois society, commodity producing, is generalized to a condition humaine, to a, to a condition of human life. In this sense, fetishism is something what is wrong, what is an illusion. But in bourgeois society, fetishism is a reality. And this reality, I, I already gave, gave the hint, so I can make this last point very short. And this reality can be seen very uh, clearly in the impersonal relations of domination, which are characterizing bourgeois society or capitalist societies. In all pre-capitalist societies, we have personal forms of domination and of rule. Just think of the example slave and master. The slave was personal property of the master. The master as a person had power, had, uh, uh, was dominating the slave. When you compare this with uh, modern relations, let us say the, the modern wage laborer and the capitalist, there is no personal rule, uh, personal domination in this sense. The laborer has a treaty with the capitalist. He gives his uh, or her labor force and receives a certain salary. And this treaty can be solved. The laborer can uh, go out of the, the capitalist uh, um, enterprise and can do something else. What the slave isn't, was not able to do. He was the personal property. So, in, in so far, in, in capitalist relations, we have not personal domination, personal rule. And a lot of bourgeois thinkers, philosophers, um, political scientists see this already as the absence of, um, of domination and of rule. In capitalist society, we are all equal and free uh, citizens. We have a government which we elect uh, by, by our votes in, in, uh, in the elections. Um, there is a rule of the government, but this is not a personal rule. It is uh, just that uh, people give power for a certain time. I have a treaty with a capitalist for a certain time. I am ready to follow the orders of the capitalist, but there is not a, a rule like uh, slave and master. 
Marx doesn't deny this. He, he stress this absence of personal rule, but he denies that this means the absence of any rule, of any domination, instead of personal rule. Capitalism is characterized by impersonal rule. You are ruled by structures. You are submitted to certain structures which you cannot avoid. In the, uh, with the wage laborer, it is very clear what uh, this means. The wage laborer can solve the, the labor treaty with a single capitalist, of course. But as a wage laborer who has no other property than the own uh, labor force, the wage laborer is dependent that he or she will find a capitalist to whom the, the labor force can be sold. So, what is uh, a remarkable uh, difference between ancient slavery and modern uh, wage uh, salary, both the slave and the modern wage laborer is exploited. But the ancient slave tries to, ex to escape, he tries to, to flee uh, from, uh, from the master. The modern wage laborer is looking for a capitalist so that he can sell his labor power to him. The one tries to escape, the other tries to find someone who is exploiting him. And this is just the consequence of this impersonal rule. There is a, a society formed by independent producers. It is by the state, fully guaranteed that everybody has his or her uh, property, the, the property is secured by the state, and you have the right to valorize your property in every way you can do. Okay, but for one big class, the only possibility to valorize the, the property is to sell his or her labor force. And so, by the rule of this structure, people try to get exploited, while in, in ancient times people try to, uh, to escape from exploitation. But this, uh, to be submitted to this impersonal rule, holds not only for the wage laborers, it holds also for the capitalists. The capitalists are also submitted to this impersonal rule. The capitalists uh, in, in their enterprises try not only to reach profit, they try to reach maximum profit. They do this not out of personal greediness, Maybe some persons show this greediness, but this is not the, the decisive point. Even if you are a very ascetic uh, person, when you become a capitalist, you are forced to try to find the maximum profit in order that you can maintain the competition with other capitalists, that you have enough money for investments, to modernize your, um, your machines, to, to conquer new markets. If you don't do this, if you are ready to stay with what you have, you will be lost in a competitive capitalist market. So, also this ruling class, the capitalists, are submitted to impersonal rule. This is something very different from pre-capitalist uh, societies. Now, this means not that we should feel pity for, um, for the, uh, 
bad uh, situation of the capitalists, but it should direct, di direct our political critique to capitalism. When we critic, when we, we formulate uh, critic against capitalism, we should always think it is not the point of persons that we uh, have to criticize how greedy, how mean the capitalists are. Maybe they are even nice, uh, uh, friendly persons. Our critique has to be, uh, has to aim the basic structures which provoke, which makes necessary certain um, patterns of behavior. And these structures, they start not, I, I focused now on, on um, capitalist relations, but they start not only in capitalist relations, they start already in commodity relations. And this is the last remark, and then I, I really uh, stop this lesson. The critique Marx formulates against capitalism is a critique which starts not only at the capitalist relations that uh, we have to get rid of the capitalists, of capitalist uh, exploitation. The critique Marx formulates already starts with commodity production. It starts with value theory, impersonal rule starts already when we produce uh, our, our use values in the form of commodities. Um, in so far, and this maybe is even a, an actual discussion, maybe a lot of, uh, of things um, sound to you rather abstract, rather theoretical, uh, what I um, introduced here, but they have very practical um, consequences. When we really want to get off um, capitalism, to get rid of uh, capitalism, then we also have to get rid of commodity production. So, kinds of market socialism, which were discussed in, in the left uh, in the last 100 years, at least from uh, the perspective of Marxian analysis, are doomed to fail just to, to reproduce the old capitalist structures uh, and in so far to get rid of capitalism means also to get rid of commodity production. And uh, I think this is the political clue of this uh, Marxian value theory, which I tried to, to highlight in some aspects uh, at, uh, at this lesson here. Thank you very much that you paid for so long time your attention to this. Thank you, Michael. And now we have at least 45 minutes for a discussion. And although this is not the Faculty of Philosophy, I see some philosophers in the audience, so don't be discouraged by this apparent lack of institutional support to ask <laughs> philosophical questions as well. So, uh, yeah, let's take the first round of questions or comments. Okay, uh, the Center for Labor Studies will start <laughs> will open the discussion. Thank you, uh, Mike and uh, Michael. Uh, one, one additional thing, maybe, uh, which I would like for you, maybe to, or which would be very interesting for the audience, here, because much of this may seem as though it's very abstract, and the political implications you have drawn out some of them uh, now, in terms of well, the, the, the problem of the control of very concept of, of market socialism from, from this fundamental um, uh, Marxian critique. But another aspect, since you have mentioned um, 
the concept of, of uh, fetishism, uh, which is also very uh, a, a very decisive uh, difference between the way you use and other people from from the uh, value form analysis tradition use the concept of, of fetishism, uh, um, which distinguishes it from from the use in, in Western Marxism uh, of the Frankfurt School and so on, is of course that um, you emphasize that, that this is not only a commodity fetishism, but there, there is a, a trinitary uh, formula. And why is this so important? Well, in many discussions on the left, which is um, so, uh, by definition a political project, um, we have of course always the question of you know, class consciousness, adequate class consciousness, ideology, and so on and so on. And often, because because I, uh, as you will um, uh, you will explain now, I, uh, I hope, uh, why it is so important to to understand fully the implications of this trinitary formula, uh, to understand um, uh, that that uh, many many strategies of well, how would you call it, appellation or interpellation of the working class as a revolutionary subject, and this uh, failure is reduced to mere uh, manipulation, ideology, false consciousness, and so on. And what is missing is uh, precisely this uh, very fundamental structural level, which to a certain extent always already pre-structures even the politi uh, I would say the possibilities or at least the plausibilities of politi political subjectivation in, in in a revolutionary sense or any other. Yeah, I agree that this is an, uh, a very important point. Um, it is also a, a shortcoming of, of many contributions to reduce fetishism to commodity fetishism. But Marx speaks also of money fetishism and capital fetishism. And besides fetishism, he analyzes in capital also what he calls mystifications, necessary reversals that some things seems to be very different uh, in, in appearance from the way uh, it is in, in uh, bourgeois society. So, uh, capitalism itself produces a certain spontaneous image of itself. And this image, uh, Marx um, gives a condensed uh, um, presentation of it in this so-called Trinitarian formula. It is a, a, a consideration we find at the end of uh, volume three of Capital, which shows such a book like Capital we have to read until the end. We, we may not stop uh, with the first volume, we have to read also the second and the third volume. And this um, Trinitarian formula, um, the image capitalism produces from itself, says very, very abbreviated, we have three basic production forces, capital, labor, and um, ground. Um, and they work together in, in order to produce something. And in some respect, they share the product. This is, by the way, also the, the picture with which most of modern economic textbooks starts, that you have these three production uh, factors which uh, collaborate. When you accept this, um, this picture, then you can talk about um, conflicts between these factors or the, the, the classes which represent them. You can speak about an injustice distribution between, let us say, capital and labor. The profits of uh, capital are too high. The salaries of labor are too low. This is very often a discourse um, promoted by trade unions or by uh, social democratic uh, parties. But all this uh, thinking already presupposes the basic structures of capitalism as given, as natural. And this naturalization is produced by uh, fetishism, by this Trinitarian formula, and it is the, the basis 
of any spontaneous consciousness. So you can develop a class consciousness, a consciousness uh, we are the workers, we have common interests, we have to fight for this interest. But when this class consciousness is bound to the Trinitarian formula, one factor against the other factor, then it's absolutely inside bourgeois society. So to, to have class consciousness not necessarily means that it is a kind of, in any uh, sense, revolutionary consciousness or transcending consciousness, that it transcends capitalist uh, uh, society, it can be a class consciousness absolutely immanent to uh, the bourgeois society. And this is the spontaneous uh, situation. And it is also the situation which is the background for a lot of class conflict. And uh, this we, we have to, to bear in mind. Uh, so the analysis of fetishism, the, the struggle also against such forms of uh, thinking has a direct political impact. It is not just a, a pure theory or a theoretical uh, dispute. It has immediate political impact, at least when you want to transcend capitalist society one day. Thank you. Uh, further questions or comments? Tommy? Uh, hi. It's you may safely ignore the question if you don't like the direction. Uh, <laughs> That's honest enough. Uh, so the Mark Mark starts capital with the wealth appears, and I'm wondering, uh, as you know, in, I'm sure in national accounts, for example, housing is imputed, monetary value is imputed. There are plenty of discussions last 20 years that there should be more imputation of monetary value uh, because. It, we have concept of wealth which radiates value which we don't know how to capture. So money is used as an abstraction to capture it. Right? So I'm wondering, in your view, how should we conceptualize wealth in Marx in, term, in terms of, I mean, what would Marx today say of production of accumulated wealth in national account? You know, how do we capture it? Because it's, it's a commodity that transaction happens once, but then for 10, 20, 30 years, there is nothing being produced that is observable, but there is something of abstract labor uh, that creates use, which is uh, which is more than what was captured by monetary transaction. And and what was more? Uh, what was this more? There are disagreement, but it's, it started with imputation. And even uh, if you look at two largest historians of national accounts, they both said that imputation had a lot to do with people reading Marx, actually. So national accountants, or Simon Kuznets, or, or even, you know, Vanoli in France, or they, they would say, we are not Marxian. Mm -hmm. But it was because of Marx's work and because of his understanding of the missing fourth element in, in Smith, uh, how he consensual value, it was, we understood that you know, there is something extra that has to be assigned. We had to assign monetary value, because it lasts for a long time. So one transaction does not capture the abstraction. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure if I really understood uh, the point of your question. Um, you started with uh, this notion of wealth. Yeah. And uh, here, okay, it, it appears in the first sentence of, um, of Capital. Um, in this first sentence, the, the reader doesn't know anything about uh, wealth. Uh, this first sentence makes clear to the reader that uh, it is not so easy about to speak uh, to speak about wealth, and this is an indirect critique of uh, Adam Smith, who named his book *The Wealth of Nations* as if wealth you can take for granted. What what is what it means, and makes Marx makes the difference 
wealth in different societies takes different forms. In capitalist societies, it takes the form of commodities. And therefore, we start our analysis with the commodity. So Marx um, makes the difference between content of wealth, content of wealth are use values, and the special um, social form of wealth, this is in a, in a market society, in, in a capitalist society, this special form is commodity. So this point I, I think is, is rather clear. But now we have the point that in, also in capitalist society we have use values which are not transformed in, uh, in commodities. And I think you, you point to, to this direction how to, um, to treat this. The point in, in Marx's um, view is rather uh, easy. He, he, in, in his um, analysis, this I, I must say in advance, when he speaks of, of value, of commodity, of productive, unproductive labor, then it's not an evaluation what is good, what is bad. It is just a description how things are going on in, uh, in capitalist society. And what is not in the form of commodity in, in bourgeois society is not part of the social form of wealth. This means not that uh, uh, the things which are not commodities are useless or of uh, uh, less importance. It is just the precise description of the view in, um, in, the, bourge in, in the capitalist society. For example, there is a long debate about um, housework, especially done by women. Did Marx recognize this? It, uh, he is um, attacked that his value theory is in, in some respect biased uh, because he underestimates the unpaid uh, work of in, in, in the house done uh, by women. I think you cannot, in this respect, you cannot criticize his value theory. His value theory is a precise description what happens in bourgeois society and housework, unpaid housework, doesn't count in this society. What you can criticize uh, Marx is that he didn't uh, stress this point to say, okay, there is a lot of unpaid work which doesn't count. He just uh, gives the analysis. I think the analysis is correct, um, but he didn't um, develop all, all the content of it. And in so far, I think from Marx, uh, you cannot develop a, a new system of um, social accounting or, or something. This is not his, his claim. He claims to analyze how capitalism is working. And capitalism works in parts by ignoring certain, uh, certain work. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm the uh, mentioned philosophers in the audience, but I have another technical question, unfortunately. Um, since you mentioned your lecture uh, at the philosophical faculty uh, sort of in a philosophical manner, I was afraid that you weren't going to mention the uh, big discussion your work uh, caused among um, political, uh, Marxist political, political economists about the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. Um, yeah, so I was wondering if it is possible for you in this moment to uh, comment it uh, 
um, somehow and uh, uh, precisely in detail I would like to hear your opinions. I know you replied to Michael Roberts already several times, but um, if you could fur further elaborate your opinion on uh, Roberts's take on organic capital, etc. Um, this is a little bit difficult. It's, it's not the, the issue here. And I don't know uh, the others, how, how much they know about this uh, debate, if I first have to explain what means organic uh, composition, what means the law of the tendency of the profit rate to fall, what are my objections to this uh, law, what are the objections to my <laughs> objections, and then I could start to, to answer uh, your question. Um, um, I, I don't see that I can do this in two minutes. Um, I can only give the hint, I, the, the critics, I, I didn't found them convincing, which, which came to the uh, critic of Michael Roberts. I already answered in, um, on the website of Monthly Review, so when it's of, of interest, just check uh, Monthly Review, put my name and uh, you will find uh, the debate. And there was also uh, another paper written by Kleiman and uh, some other authors, not published on the monthly review site. Um, and to this paper I also will answer, I, I will write a paper, it's, uh, they wrote, I, I don't remember, 10 or 20 pages, so I cannot uh, answer in, in two uh, sentences. And there I will discuss about organic composition, about uh, the attempts, can we tra trace empirically uh, the, the um, profit rate fall and so on. But um, now I'm, I'm sorry, I don't see how I can do this. Yeah, uh, it's too broad of a question. Yeah. I'm sure you're going to pick it up during the, the, the recess. Uh, are there any more questions or comments? Well, since we nominally we still have half an hour, no? Okay. Yeah. We don't have to use it up entirely, but since uh, Ali brought something up, a different matter, also a big debate, but uh, related to, to the issue of, of value. Um, you have been, and also to the, the issue of why it is necessary to read all three volumes of capital. <laughs> It's uh, the, uh, the, the accusations of your value, uh, value theory, your value theory, or the way um, you uh, present Marx's uh, value theory, to be circulationists. Uh, that is, um, since you deny that each commodity has a value substance uh, uh, as such, mm -hmm. but that it's necessarily a, a, a relational um, a category, so uh, where this value is the exp uh, can only be expressed in another commodity and so on, everything you have said, and ultimately the abstract form of value is money. And then people have said, oh, well, this uh, uh, basically uh, throws uh, overboard uh, um, uh, the labor theory of value. Yeah. But and you, as you said, it may throw overboard the labor theory of value of classical political economists, but that is precisely the point. Yeah. But maybe you would um, also uh, um, elaborate why, um, uh, why um, th th this, this whole debate, uh, why is exchange, I mean, you basically have set out the, the, the fundamentals of the argument, but maybe to make it a bit explicit for, for, for yeah. people. Yeah, this is uh, uh, an old uh, debate, um, what means value, and there are a lot of readers of Marx who's, who understand Marx and value theory in this way. Someone is working, producing, maybe producing this table, and already by the act of uh, production, value is created and now a certain value is somehow included in this table. And I try to show that this is not at all the view of Marx in this reworking manuscript. He admits that such a view can come um, by his presentation and in, in the second uh, edition he stresses the value objectivity only exists in exchange. This he, he writes 
literally before the exchange the producers think of the value they produce not just arbitrarily they try to to account when when the carpenter produces this table uh, he tries uh, to to estimate what will be the uh, the value of this table when I bring it to the market, but before the exchange, this table is a use value and not a value object. And uh, stressing this point, uh, I, I received um, the, the, the objection that this would be a circulationist um, uh, value theory as if value is produced in circulation not in production. Here I would say this is a wrongly posed question. When you already ask where is value produced either in production or in circulation then you have a, a kind of Aristotelian uh, notion of value, value as a kind of thing, either it comes from here, either it comes from there. But what Marx tries to show is value as a relational concept, relational also in so far that it combines production and circulation. What I try to stress is that value exists only in circulation but that it is not only regulated, dominated by circulation. The production sphere plays an important role in regulating and, and uh, determining value but only in combination with the circulation sphere. Any separation, any isolation to say only the production sphere or only the circulation sphere determines value, in my view, is totally wrong. Value expresses just the interference, the relation between production and circulation. But the point where you can fix value, where you can measure value, where value appears, this point is only the exchange process. It is not already present in the production sphere. Because when, when you confuse this, then you confuse the whole structure of capitalist society. In the production sphere, we have the isolated Robinsons. The Robinsons become member of bourgeois society. The private work becomes part of the total social work only in the exchange process. And when you attribute value already to, um, to the single commodity, then you erase the specificity of a market society that the, the process of uh, building uh, a society, the process transforming the Robinsons in, in members of the society is executed by the market. So uh, a value theory, um, making value an attribute to the single commodity before exchange is not anymore a theory of a capitalist market uh, society. It is something else. And so the, I think this point is very important uh, to stress. And it is important to stress that already the question, either here or there, expresses a basic misunderstanding. Maybe in relation to that, um, you can also kind of comment on another uh, point, very often point of contestation, the role of money. You, me you mentioned the role of money uh, and it's actually a pivotal role uh, in, in Marx's uh, understanding of uh, capital dynamics. And uh, 
it is often claimed that uh, Marx um, relied on the commodity theory of money and that this poses um, some kind of obstacle uh, in understanding you know, the contemporary capitalism in which uh, credit money dominates. And this is actually a claim put forward by some uh, Marxist scholars as well, not just you know, common readers of capital. So what, what, would, what, what would be your take? How would you explain uh, this um, apparent uh, incongruence between what is actually claimed in the first volume and yeah. the um, situation this, today? This is an important uh, point. Marx, uh, in, in his time, we found commodity money, there exist also credit money, paper money, all forms of money, but based on commodity money. And Marx thought that uh, this commodity root of money is indispensable, that uh, it is on the one hand an obstacle for capitalism, but an obstacle which capitalism cannot get rid of. This was uh, the opinion of, of Marx. Now, since uh, the second half of the 20th century, we face, um, uh, we are confronted with a capitalist world system which no longer is based in commodity money. It is not only dominated by credit money. This is not, uh, not the point. Credit money also in 19th century played uh, an important role. But there is no commodity behind this credit. This still gold exists and gold has a price. But gold not anymore plays a role as the anchor of uh, the money system. And so when you read very literally Marx, you can say, OK, Marx always stressed uh, capitalism cannot exist without this commodity money. Now we have uh, capitalism with commodity money. Then Marx must be wrong. Something basically happened, which is basically, basically different from what Marx tells us. Therefore, we have one line of uh, Marxist discussions where uh, Marxists try to show that still gold is the commodity money. Now it should be a hidden commodity money, but it still works as commodity money. And in so far, Marx is right. Uh, this line of uh, argumentation, I I must say, for me, is not at all convincing. Uh, the arguments are very superficial to say ma uh, gold is still uh, the commodity money. You can see this when you use these arguments, how they try to show that gold is the hidden uh, commodity money. Just substitute in such arguments gold by um, salty cucumber and the arguments are the same. They, they don't change and you have proved that salty cucumbers are the hidden commodity uh, money which uh, not even such Marxists would uh, accept. So we have really to accept that in in the contemporary um, capitalism, we have not anymore a commodity as basis, a co commodity money as uh, the basis of the money system. And now the question is, is this to, to, uh, to base the money system in a commodity money, is this really necessary in the Marxian system of categories? And I think it is not. When you read very carefully the first chapter where this commodity money comes on, it, it starts in, in value form analysis in chapter one, is continued in the analysis of the exchange process in chapter two, then you will see that Marx nowhere gives a reason that money must be a commodity, he already 
presuppose this and then he analyzes the money form. And what he shows is the necessity of the money form. So when you read carefully Marx, you will see that Marx shows the necessity of the money form. This means that something has to be the bearer of the money form. But that this something has to be a commodity in itself, Marx nowhere shows. And I must say, I also cannot see an argument how I could give reason to this. In so far, not own the, in, in, in Marx, he, he presupposes uh, a commodity as the bearer of money, and he says, okay, it's a historical fact if this commodity is gold, silver, or something else. And we can extend this proposition. We can say, no, Marx only shows the necessity of the money form, and it is also uh, a kind of historical question if the bearer of the money form is a commodity or if it is a non-commodity, if it is a sign. This is not determined by the basic structures of uh, capitalism. And then when we read the, the third volume, we can even derive some arguments Marx did not do this explicitly, I say we can derive, that a non-commodity money, a money which rests on signs like the modern uh, central bank money, fits much, much more to the modern capitalism than gold or any commodity money because Marx argues uh, already in, in volume two that the gold treasure in the, the cellar of the bank is a kind of faux frais, lost costs of capitalist um, production. There is value in the form of gold which is not used and, and uh, the capitalist system tries to reduce this faux frais. By abolishing commodity money, all these for frais are completely um, erased. They, they not exist. So already with this point, it is a big advance for a capitalist system to abolish uh, commodity money. Also in volume three, where he discusses the bank, the, the policy of the Bank of England, it becomes clear that always when there is a period of crisis, the Bank of England has to, to end with uh, the binding of the, uh, the pound notes to the gold in the cellar of the bank. So in a crisis period, Already the, the, the capitalist system, for the capitalist system, it is necessary to overcome commodity uh, money. But Marx discusses this only as a, a permanent problem of the capitalist system. He didn't see that the capitalist system really can overcome this kind of problem. So I would, I would say, the the claim of Marx analysis in Capital is to analyze the ideal average of the inner um, organization of capitalist mode of production. This he wrote explicitly, this was a quote at the end of volume three, and that he is fixed to commodity money is one of the very rare points in his analysis where he didn't met this ideal average, here he sticks to a certain historical level of uh, capitalist development. In so far, I would say, um, we can very easily drop uh, this idea of the necessity of commodity money. We don't lose anything of uh, Marxian 
analysis and uh, we make it even better, um, more fitting to, uh, to the logic of capitalism and in so far that uh, nowadays um, commodity money uh, is abolished, is not an argument against uh, the analysis uh, provided by Marx. <coughs> I have a question, I will go back to this first question about political implications of this kind of interpretation of Marx. Uh, Thierry and what are you talking about of commodity production and market socialism? I completely uh, agree with you, but there is a, some kind of political problem in a, in a, let's say, temporal or historic sense. If you say if the law of value isn't abolished as such, there's any kind of any kind of uh, sign of, of, of post-capitalist society, of socialist uh, socialist organization of production in some way. There's still some kind of behind the backs uh, uh, hidden uh, uh, hidden structural imperatives of, of capitalism. And what are these? If we put it on that level, and I completely agree. But what are the implications for the political articulation from the left perspective? Is this if this is the ultimate uh, horizon in a sense? Uh, for example, when uh, Michael Lebowitz was uh, in his uh, theories about socialist transformation but, and what was going on in the uh, uh, Soviet uh, Union, uh, he used the concept of organic system and the concept of contested reproduction. In a sense, when the revolution starts, there is no way to abolish the, the law of value uh, uh, you know, in one day, as you said, or in seven days, as God did, or something like that. <laughs> but there is this process of contested reproduction, two, two different modes of, of production, law of value, this, this, uh, he, called, he took the fro from uh, Prabhuzhensky, uh, the, the primitive uh, socialist accumulation. And, uh, but in the, in the other article, he used the concept of how to organize this process to use the concept of artificial means that are using political means that aren't so inherently socialist in a sense but they are uh, but they are artificial from that perspective but they are necessary to overcome uh, capitalism and he compared that to uh, uh, primitive accumulation at, uh, as uh, artificial mean in, in, in terms that it's not inherently capitalist uh, in a way For, of course now if we talk about the relation between some kind of theoretical analysis of current system and the way how the political left forces would organize to overcome uh, this system, then of course there is not some kind of uh, mechanical uh, mechanical uh, link like you know Marxism, Leninism, which is, is, is from this perspective it's clear that this is some kind of statist Soviet Union uh, ideological concept that from this perspective and in, in Current socialist political struggles really looks uh, ridiculous, but I think we all. Um, but I think we could find some kind of theoretical horizon or something, or political horizon. There are some structural necessary links between the way you uh, you, uh, you you construct your theoretical uh, approach and and uh, the political implications in, in terms of organization organization of this political. Uh, subject and about the, the demands on the immediate, uh, immediate life. Can you just a little bit, and, and just, and just a, a hint for me. I think that from this perspective, or the perspective of Noe Marx, like if you if you want to imagine what kind of political uh, project of political organization, of political thinking would be closest, I think it would maybe it would be Gramsci, uh, Gramsci's uh, political. Just, just to hint. Yeah. Okay, um, it, it's a good question. It, it shows that I was um, at this point not so precise in uh, what I said as I, as I wished it. When I uh, formulated this uh, critique against market socialism, uh, it was um, addressed on a very fundamental level. I didn't have in mind a transition process or so, uh, I had in mind uh, a discussion about an alternative um, society, a non-capitalist society, how uh, it can um, how, how it can be, and 
a market socialist society, this is a, a part of the discussion, some, some persons, uh, some authors see market socialism not just as a transition period, but at the fundamental alternative to a, a capitalist society as an aim of, of transition, you can say. To this my, my critique uh, was pointed. Um, when we accept this Marxian analysis of uh, value, then uh, this cannot be the alternative. A quite different uh, question is, okay, how can we come from A to B? How can we come from capitalism to uh, socialism? This is not uh, a point, uh, a thing we can just do in the one or the seven days or we now we have uh, the capitalist society, there is a revolution and tomorrow we start with the non-capitalist uh, society. Um, I cannot imagine that things would happen in this way. There is a kind of transition of reordering. Um, to give uh, general um, ideas about this transition, I'm, I would be very cautious because uh, this transition depends on the situation you, you have. In, in Soviet Union or Russia after the revolution, you had extremely bad conditions. You had a, a society, okay, Lenin maintained it, it was a capitalist society, but I have big doubts that uh, Russia in 1917 really was a capitalist society. It had some capitalist uh, elements, but uh, the main economy, I think, was non-capitalist. And to try from such a, a society and economy to come to a somehow socialist system, um, I, I have big doubts if this really is, is possible. Maybe sometimes in, in history you also have impossible uh, um, um, tasks uh, to fulfill. Um, but anyway, the, um, the transition in such a situation would be different from a transition uh, when, when you have as a starting point a high developed uh, capitalist uh, country. And again, the, um, the situation is um, different if you have an isolated uh, uh, country or if you have uh, a couple of countries. Okay, let us say Croatia. That Cro in Croatia would, be, uh, would it be possible to have a transition to socialism when all around uh, we have still capitalism? Uh, I'm sorry, this is uh, beyond what, what I can imagine. When we take the European Union okay, there would be better chances to have a, a transition to, to, uh, to socialism in the European Union while you have capitalism around. It would be very, very hard, but perhaps, perhaps it would be possible. In a single small country like Croatia, I think it, uh, I have no idea how such a transition should look like. So the transition um, must uh, um, be dependent on the situation. When you now mention Gramsci, uh, then I think Gramsci already comes into play before such a transition process. When such a transition process should be have a chance of, of success, even a small chance of success, it must be supported by the majority of the people. It cannot be the, the work of a small party or a small group who took power, political power, by, by whatever. And to, uh, that the majority of the people 
supports such a transition process, there must be a kind of hegemony of ideas and so on. So maybe uh, Gramsci came, uh, comes into play when we speak about the way to a situation where a transition process can be discussed. But nevertheless, also here I must say, even when the, the majority of people would uh, support a transition process, uh, there is not at all, um, we, we cannot be secure that then a transition process uh, would be successful. Unfortunately, the chances to overcome capitalism are much, much less than the chances that uh, capitalism uh, maintains. But nevertheless, uh, we shouldn't be um, passive by, by, this, uh, by this result. Um, we must try, even when our chances are, are bad, and sometimes in history, um, we are also lucky persons and maybe one day we will manage to to start with such a transition process. But now to, to give a, a blueprint for the transition, I think this is uh, impossible. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have Tony here, but you have anything else? <laughs> no, then we'll go. <coughs> okay, two questions. <laughs> oh, okay. The last two first, Yeah. Uh, first question, really simple. Okay. When you say we need to go beyond commodity production, in your own mind, forget Marx. In your own mind. Uh, if you can forget Marx for a moment. Does, does something like allocation according to needs produced by public sector or by firms in socialism here in Yugoslavia, not by public sector, allocated according to needs, does that to you is, is that to you a form of moving beyond commodity production, even though its inputs are commodities in most cases, but its outputs are allocated according to needs? That's one, then I'll do the other one, but you tell me. Okay, then. Does when, it even resemble? When, when, when this is the simple question, then I uh, <laughs> uh, don't want to see what is a complicated question. Um, I, I'm very skeptically in this uh, to have commodities as input and as output non-commodity, I cannot rem uh, imagine how this should work because you always have an interdependent production. Also, the, the public sector, when it has input as commodities, then someone else must produce these commodities as output. So you always have then input and output as commodities. Um, maybe you only do a kind of redistribution, that the public sector takes a lot and redistributes it, but then you have um, also a kind of contradiction of two logics, uh, a logic of commodity production, of valorization on the one hand, and a logic of fulfilling needs. This leads to conflicts. As a transition strategy, in my view, maybe this makes sense to say to, to make bigger the public sector, but when you have these uh, conflicts between the, the private commodity producing sector and the public sector, then uh, you must accept these conflicts and fight against the, the private sector and uh, not to have the idea, yes, we have to come to a kind of of equilibrium, by this uh, the private sector will win the, the game. We crushed the private sector eventually. Yes, the, the, this kind of, of sector, um, commodity producing sector, for me can only have a transitional existence. But the question, may, maybe uh, this can lead very simply to, um, to misunderstandings. When I uh, say it ha can has only a transitional existence, the consequence is not a big state which runs everything according to the Soviet uh, model. Uh, the model would be uh, the free associations of production, 
not a, a strong center, free associations, but these free associations not as competitors in a market, like in, in the model of market socialism, but free associations which communicate, which consciously cooperate with the other associations and together uh, set out uh, uh, the design of social production. This would be the alternative and uh, the state should have uh, the, the fate which uh, Engels, uh, Friedrich Engels very nicely formulated, the state should slowly die away. So an, a non-capitalist society, a socialist uh, society, of course, is a society without state and not with an, uh, a total state which controls everything. Okay. So, so now, now the, the complicated the question. question. So Mislav asked you about the role of money today being, being credit being much more important. So what he asked was how does Marx theory apply to today? And you said Marx always talked about the ideal average. But the question I'm posing you, in the ideal, ideal average, when Marx lived, the production of the state in, in GDP, when we recalculate backwards, the UK was less than 1%. Today, it's 35%. And actually, 35 is the, it's the average of EU 15 countries. Now, it is, I mean, the workers involved in it are only 6 7%, so it's not as much. So, no, 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 no. Now, now I no, think no, you... No, no, I know this is, but in the, no, the liver is, is how much, in ideal average, capitalism today in Europe produces 35% of final goods and services by the state. No, 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 no. This is, this is, this is wrong. Uh, These are not common. No, 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 no. <laughs> this, is, this is completely um, wrong. I think this is uh, a nice... Um, um, problem created by, by statistics. Okay. Um, for example, um, in, I, I, can, I, I take the German um, example because I, I know better than from, from other states. In Germany, you have a kind of public uh, pension fund that the workers um, pay a part of, of the wage, um, to a certain fund, and this fund uh, pays the, the pensions. Because it is publicly run, it counts to this 45% uh, uh, you said. But that it's publicly run is only a, a kind of formality. When the uh, pension fund is completely private run, but works according to the same logic. Economically, nothing has changed, but in the statistics, the, uh, this state, so-called state quote, reduces from 45% to, let us say, 40%. Also, real, the, the real e economic impacts would be zero. So when we speak really of production, of commodity production, then the uh, part of the German state, perhaps it is not 1%, maybe it is uh, 3%, because some big companies are still in uh, state ownership, like um, uh, the trains, uh, Deutsche Bahn, the, the train company is still uh, in state, uh, stately hold. Um, the telecommunication system, the, sta the state still has a, a, sh a part of, of the shares. So this is state-run um, production. But the logic of this production is purely capitalist. So it is just, uh, for example, in, in the telecommunication, it is just if the state is the, the owner of the shares, or if I am the owner of the share, or my grandmother, it makes no difference because it is a, just a it's capitalist it's, it's, uh, uh, enterprise. The same thing. You misunderstood. I, I was not clear. Health, education, and care services in UK, for example, are well over 20% on their own. I think they're 22, 23. When you remove pensions and when you remove ownership in capitalist-run companies, 
So simply producing outputs in health, education, care, and housing is 20% of GDP, around there. For example, these are non commodities they are allocated according to needs. You go in education, you get it so far, now you pay for it. It's changing slowly. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, this is, yeah, not, uh, you, are, you are right. Sorry, now, clear first time. Now I, I misunderstood something. This is, um, this is another thing. Um, there are certain tasks, certain activities which um, are necessary for a capitalist system of production and, and reproduction, for example, education. Uh, the capitalist enterprises need not only workers, they need educated workers, they need uh, qualified workers. And the question is, these prerequisites of uh, capitalist production, are they produced in a capitalist manner? Let us say a private school produces education as a commodity. The parents pay for the education of their children so that they are uh, qualified. And the school can be run completely as a capitalist enterprise making profits because what the parents pay is much more than the school has uh, to, to spend, or is it provided by the state? In the long historical uh, run, uh, it is true that there is a tendency that these state tasks um, extend. It is even, it, it, in economics it has a, a name, it is Wagner's uh, law, it is, by the way, the same Wagner to whom the, re the um, remarks to Wagner were directed by Marx. The last <laughs> Marxian manuscript, very important manuscript, direct to, to this Adolf uh, Wagner. Um, this is, on the one hand, true. Uh, it shows that capitalist um, um, production becomes more complex, needs more prerequisite and the state has to provide them. So the state as a non-commodity producer becomes more uh, important. But on the other hand, in capitalist um, development, it is also al always questioned what the state really has to do and what can be done by gaining profits by private enterprises. A nice um, example are uh, the trains uh, in 19th century. These train uh, companies started as shareholding uh, companies. They uh, started to, to construct, but uh, then in many cases they, uh, they couldn't continue, they went to bankruptcy, but the trains were so e economically important that the state took uh, over the, the companies and as a state activity provided the, the economy, you can say, this mobility. In 20th century, end of the 20th century, the situation changed. It was possible that trains again can be run with profits and uh, this wave of privatization started. So what was before a non-commodity of the state now was produced as a commodity and uh, very similar tendencies we have in health, in education, in, in pension funds. So, um, I'm not sure if nowadays we can, can really hold Wagner's law that always the, um, the state sector will extend. Maybe uh, it will extend from these beginnings to, to a certain amount and then in waves it will become bigger. In the next crisis it will become smaller. Uh, or, uh, no, in, it will become bigger, then there is a wave of privatization, it becomes smaller. In the next crisis, when we have a lot of bankruptcies, it will become bigger again. This is, um, this is true, this is an, 
but I, I wouldn't say that this uh, in any way objects to, to the ideal average Marx um, uh, analyzed in Capital. It points out the necessity of the analysis of state, which Marx wanted to do. He, he had the idea to write a book on the state, an, an abstract uh, uh, book on the state, like on capital, which he didn't uh, do. And in such an uh, analysis, this point uh, indeed would uh, be an important point. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Michael Heinrich, for this um, um, lecture and for the answers in the Q and A se se section. I think we covered a lot of ground uh, in this two hours, and I hope we will continue our discussion at the Faculty of Philosophy at eight o'clock. That's room D six. So see you there. <laughs>